Perfect. Sometimes if Alex isn't on, it doesn't want to let me do it, but it worked. Okay, you guys see my screen okay? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity to give a little bit uh, more detail on, on sprints here um, and been really enjoying attending these these Monday calls here, seeing what's going on in the community. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll just jump right into it. Um, so you guys, and maybe some of you, I, I know Russell just saw, <laughs> Russell, you, you just saw pretty much the same thing when I presented to Angeline. So, so uh, feel, feel free to multitask. Um, it's pretty much going to be the same uh, as before. Uh, but, but hopefully you all will walk away with uh, a better understanding understands usually it takes a couple of times to 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 understand what's going on so with this second more in-depth uh, overview of sprints i hope you all find that helpful and again thanks for the opportunity um so with that we actually just finished a round of demo ones um to different folks uh and, and so you guys are sort of getting the demo one uh we're going to have a demo two slated for uh, September, October time period where we're going to have a little bit more uh, to show in terms of uh, the the actual for how we used sprints um, to predict solar energetic particles. All right. So first things first, uh, next gen overview. Um, just really quickly, we're an enterprise IT company, mainly doing DoD contracting. Um, when when we when I joined NextGen back uh, in 2016, we were about 30 or 40 folks. Now we're approaching 200, so we're a pretty quickly growing company uh, with with good senior leadership and and direction in in terms of how to how to make solutions IT wise for the DoD. Right, this is sort of next gen is is awesome. Um, so five years consecutive as as a fast as one of the fastest growing companies in the United States. Um, just recently, we were notified that there's a six year there, and then just uh, some of our customers and partners and and appraisals and, and things like that. All right, so what do we do? So services just on your right there, software development, systems engineering, cybersecurity. Some solutions, multi domain data fusion, architecture modernization, situational awareness. And then in the RD department, which is mainly where I'm at, uh, we do, I do a lot of weather from a data science perspective. We have some drone programs, which is always fun to talk about. Uh, and then machine learning, AI, um, and space weather. And I've also done some machine learning for soil moisture for. For a, another project, which was using a very similar ecosystem as what I'm about to show you here. Really the goals for, for this demo is to demonstrate a state of the art space weather forecasting ecosystem. So I'm going to show you the competitiveness of the model metrics for forecasting solar energetic particles. I'm going to hopefully convince you that it's built to be transitioned. It's a cloud native technology. And then furthermore, I'd like you to walk away with the big picture. And the big picture is sprints can be a virtual O to R, R to O center. So if you've paid attention in the space weather community, there's been, especially in the last five to 10 years, there's been a lot of emphasis on how do we do O to R, R to O. It's a particular challenge for us because of heliophysics is interdisciplinary, uh, coupled coupled systems uh, and very strongly rooted in academia. So. Uh, how do we how do we sort of take that and and transition it where appropriate? Um, so I'm gonna again. This technology was built to do solar energetic particle forecasting. However, there hopefully you'll see that there are a lot of uh, heliophysics functions uh, and capabilities that that it could be extended to be used for. Um, and so I think that's enough on this for for demonstration uh, for demo goals. So sprints, uh, a little bit of background. So first was, I, I guess, was initially funded back in 2014 from NASA SHRAG, uh, Johnson Space Radiation Analysis Group, really taking the data-driven approach to forecasting SEPs. <clears throat> and then we got a NASA Phase 1 STTR in 2016, so a little bit after that. Um, we weren't awarded a Phase 2, and then we worked hard 
transferred to Topic transferred over to Air Force Cyber Program Office, and we're currently 12 months into that project, and and that's where we're at in in the demo uh, one scenario here. All right, so some of the key takeaways. So just the blue box on the right is sort of the generic one, right? So an ecosystem for collaborative and repeatable space weather data processes, science, and forecasting. All right, so what does it have today? And keeping in mind, a lot of this can be extended quite easily, uh, provided that you have the resources in place, right? So sort of a big, big asterisk there, but again, it's, it's meant to be extensible. So it has an, a Python API, has a database, that's supported by timescale, uh, SQL, has a REST API for more of the machine to machine processes, um, and it's Jupyter Hub based. The, the database currently has goes X-rays, protons, electrons, 1985 through present, ACE and Discover solar wind measurements, 1998-ish through present. And then additionally, one of the reasons I really wanted to get um, a collaborative ecosystem was because of catalogs in this field. Uh, you have solar flare catalogs from NOAA. You have solar flare catalogs from uh, Joe, Mary, and Bob uh, researching at different institutions. Um, and then additionally, you have solar energetic particles uh, published in the literature. NOAA SWIPSI has their own. Uh, Donkey has, has CME catalogs. So, so what, what is authoritative? Uh, what should we be using? Um, and then furthermore, how do you associate a flare to a SEP, to a CME, to a shock? And so everybody can share that sort of same information. I'm not saying you're going to get 100% agreement. What I'm saying is using version controlled capabilities and the type of technology I'll show you here is that you can probably get 90% of the way there uh, in terms of agreement. Um, and then people can impose their own different definitions. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons driver force uh, for this, because if you take a data driven approach, you want to make sure everybody's using the same thing. You want to compare apples to apples. Typically today metrics for, for, for models for forecasting um, are compared apples to oranges because you're going off of a different event catalog database and it's a real issue. Um, so, so I'm hoping that this is sort of an opportunity to, to see a, a possibility out of that or to mitigate that issue. Um, so it, 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 it supports external catalogs. Um, so if you wanted to, you could import a bunch of AIA data. And so you could have it on your local cache. It's on AWS GovCloud. Um, and then, of course, if you have Python notebooks, data fusion is, is a pretty obvious thing that, that you're able to do. Uh, machine learning processes and models, this is something that we, we excel at at NextGen. Um, so you're able to explore, develop, validate, and deploy uh, beyond the scikit learning libraries and things like that and, and the Jupyter Hub ecosystem. We're also working with what's called the Streamline Machine Learning Ecosystem developed out of AFRL Rome, which was a $10 million project um, where you're able to rapidly test, evaluate, uh, and containerize uh, uh, state-of-the-art algorithms in machine learning um, and speed up that whole process. And so we're potentially looking to couple the Sprint's ecosystem to SML um, and for curiosity, if you guys have heard of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center that the DOD is standing up, um, there's a lot of interest around that streamlined machine learning capability uh, that, that came out of AFR Rome, which, which uh, NextGen helps support. And then, of course, the, the second to last bullet point there, really critical, I, th I think, as well as is, uh, all these wonderful open source libraries just position this ecosystem in a way to... Uh, collect the community, so to speak. So SunPy, Komodo, uh, PySat, I think, Russell, right? I keep doing that wrong, so let me correct that here. PySat, SpacePy, PlasmaPy, Chianti, um, and then you can have different hooks into APIs. Um, and so more on that a little bit when you see the architecture. So these are just some of the sprint uh, uh, key takeaways that I'd like you to walk away with, but hopefully some of the visualizations uh, in interactive demos, will will uh, solidify these points for you. Hey, Alec, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. 
if you explain this later, feel free to just tell me so. But sure. I'm curious with your machine learning stuff. Um, I'm loosely involved with, with some machine learning things over here at LASP. And I know that detecting solar flares has always been one of the holy grails. No one can quite crack it yet. Um, do you do you use a neural net kind of approach when you're doing machine learning stuff there? Or do you use a more like, you know, statistics based stuff? Yeah, so you're talking about just detecting in a time series like x-rays? Yep. Yeah, so straight up, we use the, the Marcus Ashwand and Sam Freeland paper from 2010, 2011, if you're familiar with that. I am um, not. So, yep, take a look at that paper. Um, that's what they use on their Lockheed LMSAL.com latest events page. And if okay. you notice that they have detections on that event. So we basically took it. And I'd like to think we improved it a little bit, um, at least based on the IDL code that Marcus gave me like eight years ago now. And then I <laughs> reverse engineered it and put it in Python. And I got it to work with not only flares, but SEPs, CMEs, and eventually high speed streams. Oh, there you um, go. So, so more on that in a little bit, but actually no, no machine learning needed on that as of right now, but we are trying to execute that code to work in real time because it's different uh, than when you work on it from a historical perspective because you give it a start oh, yeah, and yeah. end time, right? And then you have your, your whole data set of GOES x-rays. And so you know the future already. And so when you do boxcar smoothing, that is an issue when you say, okay, I don't know the future. Now I want to see when I detect these events. And so actually we're going through that process right now um, and, and maybe I can show you a little bit of an example on that. But I know there's been success in general on, on machine learning. I've seen some type two, type three radio burst machine learning detection. But for me, um, it's always, if it, it's gotta be done in real time, especially if, if your object, mm -hmm. object, uh, objective is to do forecasting, right? So a flare goes off and then, yeah. So you'll see some of that in a little bit. Very cool, um, very cool. Um, yeah. Can I, can you say the names of the authors for that paper again so I can look yeah, it up? Yeah, Fre Freeland and Ashwanden. Freeland and what, how do you spell the other one? A-S-C-H-W-A-N-D-E-N. -E Marcus, uh, if I spelled it wrong, uh, it's been a while. I put that in the chat, in the chat just okay. because. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. All right, so so what did we use this technology? Why did we build this technology? It was to forecast SEPs. Uh, it's important for NOAA SWPSI. Uh, they support high flyers uh, for IKO. Uh, it's important for NASA, obviously, human space flight and their own satellite fleet. And it's important for the DOD, for their high flyers and for single event upsets on, on, uh, on their satellites. They wanna discriminate uh, then do anomaly attribution, right? So that's that's the key thing, um, especially as space becomes more contested and, and space really becomes, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a war zone. All right, so where are we at? We're, we're <clears throat> basically wrapping up quarter four here. I have the final demo one with NASA, CCMC, and SHRAG this coming Wednesday. Uh, during their ICEP call. So going to do a very similar demonstration for those folks then. Um, and we're basically trying to garner interest between demo one and demo two. So come end of the program, we're not just, you know, okay, now we need to wait for another year of funding. That's great. Uh, that does nobody any good. So we're trying to line up funding pretty much for, for right around, uh, uh, beginning of 2022, so we can keep the lights on and, and keep progressing, increasing our TRL levels um, and all that good stuff. All right, so on to the demonstrations. Um, and the reason I'm not going full screen is, is so I can see you guys um, and, and see anything in the chat. Um, so let me know if you have an issue reading anything. But let me just read the bullet points one, two, and three, and then zoom into the architecture diagram. And then we can get more into the interactive demos. Uh, and by the way, my goal would be to try to wrap up with 10 minutes left um, for, for discussion, but no reason to, to interrupt me and, and uh, 
um, and just ask questions and fire away. So please do so. So Sprint's an ecosystem for streamlined data fusion analysis and machine learning enables new forecasting techniques and a collaborative R to O, O to R ecosystem and gives you the ability to explore, visualize and analyze large solar imagery and helio data sets. This is sort of a in development uh, a point here where we're trying to get X-ray to work with the world coordinate systems. And, and so you can stream through and analyze uh, large solar imagery data sets such as AIA. And then it's a modern cloud native deployment model. Um, and that helps with rapid uh, agile transition to operations. Um, and so zooming in on the architecture diagram. So here again, we're focused on sort of space weather forecasting. So the upper left will will do operational data coming from NOAA SWPSI. It goes into our ingest um, and, and that goes to the time scale database. On the bottom left, you, you'll know that there's an arrow coming from nowhere. More on that in a little bit, but suffice to say, uh, it's just coming from different data repositories, whether it's from CCMC, VSO, uh, you know, the heck, whatever. Um, so, and, and then you can imagine other APIs beyond Lattice, SunPy, and Donkey. You can have PySat there as well. So all these different APIs that these different libraries have constructed, you can perhaps align them in such an ecosystem as this. If I, if I give uh, Russell like, hey, Russell, you got 50 gigabytes to work on the cloud or, or maybe CCMC, if you're a registered user on this type of thing, they, they say, hey, you get 50 gigabytes uh, as a user on this. And so if, if, if the time series data isn't enough for you, which is very likely, even though we, we, pick, the, we pick the GOES, X-rays and ACE and Discover data as sort of foundational space weather data sets and heliophysics data sets, a user will probably want to bring in other data, whether they're looking at a singular event or they want to look at more of a, a wide ranging historical time period. Um, hey, but Alec, yeah. I want to point out that I am a core developer of Lattice and I'm surprised and happy that you included that as a data source. Nice. Yeah. So, so I talked with Tom Berger and I, I forget the lady's name who's been working on on Lattice so hard, but I, I had a good interaction with with the Lattice team and some of the people from LASP um, and Space Weather Trek. Um, so again, uh, Stronger Together is, is sort of the, the emphasis of this project. If we can rope in, you know, the community, um, and this is worthless, right? Without without people being on it and, and things like that. So I think the idea is where can we align our efforts um, and where, where can we go after the big fish um, in this area and not, not try to work in, in in different avenues, but start to work together. Um, and, and also for what it's worth, if you guys heard, heard of Pangeo, um, you, I can envision sprints being more of pan helio uh, type of deal. Um, so, uh, but it's Dockerized AWS, and then you see the Python API. And then of course it's linked to Jupyter Hub. And hey, if you want your analysis dashboards, if you want an operational dashboard, Bouquet server is a great way to go. So this environment really can provide it all in terms of doing the analysis, data fusion, data ingest, all the way to, hey, I want to deploy a tool for somebody to use. Who is that user? It's a person who just wants to download data. Cool. Uh, just an analyst, an operator, a forecast. Maybe an RDU program can use this uh, and, and probably would 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 take great advantage of this because we all know the difficulty of of, of of, of collecting all these disparate data sources together. And then of course, in the, uh, on the upper portion, uh, you have all your Python libraries. So more on the left side, you have the Helio focused, uh, libraries here that can be organized. And this is where I was talking to Russell and Angeline from NRL in terms of, Hey, okay. What, and, and, and Russell was talking about how PySat uh, can be used to sort of orchestrate the libraries more cohesively together. Um, and, and this is an ecosystem that can wrap around that maybe even further. Um, but, but we're, we're currently discussing, um, you know, where to take that if, if anywhere. And then on your right in that block, you have your more staple hardcore state of the art, uh, data science, uh, type of type of libraries there as well. And then directly from the Jupyter hub, you can just open up a terminal 
and we do this all the time for our PRs and whatnot at NextGen, um, you can just go right to Bitbucket or GitHub. Uh, so again, all inclusive ecosystem, that's what we're striving for. All righty, so let me zoom back out here. The next couple of slides I'll go, I'll go through a little bit more quickly here, um, and, and then I'll get into a demo, I swear. All right, so the IT infrastructure, the components, um, my data engineer, she, she's great, and she would demonstrate sort of the back end to you. Um, so you just kind of have to envision that this happened at this demo. She would pull up the AWS console. She would show you the REST API, how it works with Swagger. If you guys don't know Swagger, it's pretty slick. Uh, she would give you an overview of PG Admin and then a high level Jupyter Hub um, showing, showing some of the uh, Python API calls. All right, so how much does this all cost? Um, well, for all the data that we have, uh, again, in situ data is not a big deal, but again, from a data-driven perspective and a data science perspective, it's, it's helpful when you have uh, only so many SCP events to collect as many as possible. Um, but these are the AWS costs associated with these sort of in situ measurements from GOES and ACE. Um, so it's $500 a month. It's really not that much. And, and storage outweighs the compute. Um, and, and we have about 20 users on, on the system uh, at, at, at varying levels from poking around to not using it at all, but registered uh, to folks like myself and, and other co eyes who, who really use the API and, and, and uh, take advantage of their full RAM that they have, which is, you know, scalable, everything's scalable, right? So, so on previous projects, I've had my RAM scaled up to eight gigabytes because I've needed it. Uh, on this, it's typically uh, two gigabytes uh, to get most of the stuff we need to, to get done. Um, but there you can see uh, that the active usage is, is around 700 gigabytes and, and we have a, available uh, to go up to two terabytes uh, on the database. Question uh, on the downloads. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any kind of throttling or monitoring or advisement or whatever on people who say, oh, you know what? That's interesting. I just give me all the data and they just click download, right? Because that's kind of what you're trying to avoid with these cloud systems, right? Is you want people to keep the data in the cloud so that you don't have to pay the egress. Yeah. What's your so approach to that? Yeah, because our team's relatively small and, and we have control. I mean, that issue has popped up before where actually it was a project where I told an intern like, hey, upload eight gigabytes of data to the hub, right? Not to the database because uh, it's not database and actually crash the system because we had a backup which would go every every day for a week, right? So that eight gigabytes actually multiply that by seven. I'm like, why are we backing up that much? So there does need to be that kept in mind that that part of the system needs to be mature, matured more um, in order for it to be, you know, flexible and 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 uh, so so a, a back end engineer doesn't need to be hands on and hand holding the whole time. Uh, but but certainly we've we've seen that there are capabilities for doing that um, and and limiting that. Uh, you can flag warnings and, and things like that. We haven't gotten too much into that because we're relatively still controlled with the team. The way you get access for this right now is getting your IP whitelisted. If anybody here is interested in the system, happy to IP whitelist you so you can poke around and see what I see and do what I do here. You can't change anybody else's Python notebook. You can copy it and put it into your local folder and things like that. Um, but but a lot of that, you know, needs to be fully explored when you talk about, hey, we're going to open this up to the CCMC community. And a lot of those initial tasks are going to be just that. How do we prevent, you know, system failure because somebody downloaded half a terabyte of SDO data um, and uploaded it into the system, either Jupyter Hub or otherwise. So, again, that local data cache, hopefully that limitation you know, and certain flags and warnings will, will come into play there. But that very much needs to be more fleshed out when you, when you start to, to, to build a project um, in, in, that, in that direction, which I hope it does, right? So I hope we get that opportunity to explore that a little more. All right. Hey, uh, Alec? Yeah, Jack. So um, 
So are you going to allow people to upload data then? Is that, or does Sprint do that? It seems like you have a tight control over the data availability, right? Yeah, so, so basically anybody, any of our users can upload data to the Jupyter Hub. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no limitation. And so if they upload beyond this, I think we actually just upped the Sprint's Hub from 27 gigabytes up to 100 gigabytes because I wanted to look at the sous vide data set, um, which is very similar to AIA from, from Noah Nesdis and, and Dan Seaton. Um, so I upped it, we upped it to 100 gigs because, again, we had it crashed. And anybody can do that. So anybody, if they wanted to, could crash the system outright who's a current user, right? Um, and, and also, if, if you use the SunPy API and you start to call different uh, images from, from Lasco or whatnot, and you go crazy and write a, write, a, write a routine that says, give me all the data between you know, these timestamps, you could crash the system too, doing it that way. Um, so, so again, there, there, there are, there are ways of, of crashing the, 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 the console and the, and the cloud capability and the hub ecosystem by doing that. But again, uh, be, because we're all, we're all playing fair on here right now, and we're all aware of the current, uh, computing limitations and storage limitations, you know, we're, and, and for this project, we're still very much focused on the in situ data sets and, and sort of the metadata, which tend not to be terribly large. Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, if I heard John correctly, he was worried about the egress costs. So do you permit people to download data from uh, sprints? Because it'd be very simple to set up a, a script that just downloads a one megabyte file a million times, right? And then yeah. suddenly your data egress costs have gone through the roof. Yeah, so, so we haven't done that uh, okay. in terms of local downloads. We haven't looked into that. Um, again, we're hoping that people stay next to the data, right? This is the right. key key part of, I, I think, you know, the, the future with, with doing data analysis. Do the analysis at the site of the data. Please don't download it if you don't have to, if you have to fine. Um, but you know, we, we haven't really, you know, delved into that much either because we hope that you don't have to download it. However, one of the, I'll talk about this now briefly. One, one of the applications of sprints is actually sort of a, uh, a next generation capability to smoke, to support SMEX missions. So we've actually had a couple of, uh, discussions with, with SMEX teams on how sprints can be used uh, as a platform to support the entire SMEX mission in terms of data and analysis. So you can imagine that there's an upcoming SMEX mission. They believe that they're gonna have roughly 40 to 50 terabytes of data. So we can design a, a cloud um, sprints hub system that supports all of that data. Um, and we want the users to go to that whatever it is, sprints.com slash SMEX mission one. And then there are a couple of dashboards there that allow the users to easily explore all the data that that mission has captured to date. And then in addition, allows those users to download, hopefully now more specifically than ever, data that they want to download. Um, and so again, when you get to that point, um, or that specific application you do want, uh, yeah, like, like you guys are discussing sort of the egress, uh, limitations and things like that. So that's, that's sort of, again, if, if you start to go in that direction, um, or, or, uh, or similar directions, you know, that's, that's when we would put those sort of limitations in place. And again, we don't see any, anything preventing us from doing that. Uh, we just haven't done it under this project because we're, we're for, for the moment, be well self-contained um, and, and people again are, 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 are playing nicely, uh, so to speak, in the ecosystem. So at least for now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem, no problem. All right, cool. So, so on to an interactive demonstration here. Um, so this is the Sprint's main dashboard. Uh, I think it still should be live here. Um, so let me just go ahead and zoom in. So, so this dashboard displays all the data 1985 through present for GOES. 
um, and ACE and Discover. And the way we did it is that these are only operational data sets. This is, quote, using our, our quote, continuous measurements database. We do have other GOES measurements in here, but these are the operationally designated measurement instruments from NOAA SWPSI because we wanted to use, we wanted to make sure our database was comprised of the operationally defined or designated measurements uh, that were captured on GOES um, uh, during the time because there were transitions like, hey, we're going to switch from GOES 12 to GOES 14, et cetera, and things like that. So, of course, here we have the the uh, Halloween storms, this is using Bokeh and a Bokeh server. Um, and you can see it's very interactive um, and, and it's pretty responsive too. Um, so I'll just zoom in here and you can see, you can get, get, get that fine resolution of the data. You know, your steps here are five minutes, your flares are one minute, and you can see the start and end times of the events. This is using the Freeland Ashwanden detection capability. Um, and, and just a note, in general, it tends to detect events too early uh, by the eye because of that boxcar smoothing method, especially for um, the five minute flares. Uh, it's better if you have higher resolution, obviously, able to capture those der derivatives with more uh, accuracy. Um, but even on the flares, you can see it's probably detected too early and that's what we're looking at currently. Um, so anyways, I'm going to show you sort of three mini demonstrations within this dashboard here. Uh, so the first is, is that this dashboard allows you, and if you notice, there are tables on the upper right here. Um, you can edit these tables here, and we've connected it to the database. So you'll see in the upper right, so this is your typical flares, seps, and, and solar wind, right? So in the data table on the right, you have your flare IDs, your start and your end times, the latitude and longitudes and no active region numbers of those flares. So if I go ahead and, and try to select a couple of flares here that are associated uh, to a SEP here, if I can find a good one here, there we are. Um, so you can see in this database, uh, this flare is associated to that SEP. Um, and that flare has a latitude of negative 16 and a longitude of negative eight. Uh, if you disagree with that and you have authority to change this in the database, you can go ahead. And what's more is you would be making a fork of this catalog, a different version. So it'd be underscore, you know, it'd be next gen version one associated catalogs underscore Ireland or something like that. And, and so that now Jack, uh, from that point on would be making corrections to his version catalog uh, because he disagreed with the metadata, with the start and end time of a flare, with of a flare to a SEP. And what's more is you can change, uh, you can disassociate these events. Let's say for argument's sakes that that flare is not associated to that SEP. These widgets down on the bottom allow you to disassociate these events and furthermore, reassociate the flare that was just disassociated to a flare that you think is correctly, should be correctly associated to that step. Uh, so that's sort of demonstration one. Um, uh, you know, just really quickly, I'll, I'll change the time here if I can. Um, so sure, of this event here, I'm gonna say this event started a little bit later. So I'm gonna go ahead and put down 12, uh, 50 UT instead of 50 UT. And I'm going to say um, update event here. Oh, I think I need to click return. That. Click return, update event. And again, all of this is using Python, uh, Bokeh, and on, in the back end server. And I do have an architecture diagram on that. So I think, did I do that correctly? You know what? Maybe it was. Oh, you know, let me, let me just restart this to make sure it's live because it was dead for a while and it tends to time out. Uh, so let me just kick that off again. So that's going to be the first demonstration. The second one is I'll, I'll show you a, um, so here we go. I'll just click on uh, this guy here and try it again. Twelve fifty update event. Oh, maybe I need to edit it here. Is it? Okay, so there you can see I changed the end time there and it 
it says, okay, now this event is going to end a little bit longer out here. So I just changed the end time from there to there. Uh, so you can do this. And if I hit update catalog, that'll persist it to the database. And now my machine learning expert, Brianna, she will immediately see that update on her API and her notebooks. So if she executes her notebooks, I just told her, hey, Brianna, I just made 30 different corrections to these associated events by walking through them. She'll go through and give me updated metrics based on them or, or other things like that. Um, and then let's see, uh, the additional demonstration here is because we're doing forecasting applications. I'm gonna jump to uh, a time period that we have the, an actual forecasted persisted into the database. So that's gonna be, I believe, May 9th. This is one of the uh, CC change events. Um, so if we get, give it a second here, it's uh, using the, the API and the database to update this. Oh, I'm running low on battery here, plugging my laptop. So if we just give it a second here, it should. Demos are always great, live demos. I swear this was working before. I'm making me eat my words here. Sorry, guys. Oh, come on. Oh no, it just killed. All right, guys. So now you're going to see how the sausage is made here. So it did, it did look like it timed me out. So launch server. So I'm, this will be a little bit of background anyways. So here, if I just go to new terminal, this is how I launch the dashboard. So source activate sprints. So you're running Panel it serve. from source code right there in Jupyter Hub. Mm -hmm. yep. Neat. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty sick. All right, try, try again. And that's how I would run this if I wanted to use it myself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a different way because this, this particular way for me executing it gives me permission to change what's in the database. Um, gotcha. There's another way where pe people can see the dashboard but won't have access to the database because we still, we haven't fully fleshed out the version controlling and things like that yet. Um, but a little bit to be developed. So kicking off here always takes a little bit of a minute, um, but, but generally updating the time. And, and that's what I'll try to demonstrate really quickly. Uh, keeping in mind, I'm, uh, I'm, I might leave five minutes towards the end for discussion. Sorry, guys. Uh, so sorry. this is this is open to the outside, or you said you had to have whitelisted IP for it? Yeah, whitelisted IP, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people's IPs are dynamic anymore, right? They don't necessarily get a static one from their organization. Yep, it's true. I'm I'm one of those people. So yeah, uh, I I email uh, pretty frequently to my engineers, and they're like, again, I'm like, yeah, I'm in Montana. It changes um, so quite a bit. Uh, I can close this guy. So sorry, guys. Um, so look, it's this is for what it's worth. This is what it's doing on the back end here. Um, it's just sort of prepping everything. All right, cool. All right. Sorry. That was a little painful. Uh, apologies. So 2012, May 9th will be the start date update plot. Give it a few, pretty, pretty fast. If you think that this is going through uh, a bunch. So here we, again, looking at this date here, I know that there's a flare about to occur that causes a CEP, a CEP event. So if I step forward an hour and again, give it a second, these are some forecast probabilities from MAG4 or MAGPI as we're calling it now because it's recently written in Python. Um, so here you can see a flare has just gone off. Uh, and based on that, we have some probabilities of the CEP event um, that could be associated with it. Um, and so this is, these are our results basically for the SEP challenge event. Uh, and this, this is in probability, just keep in mind zero to hundred percent. These are the five different AFRL requirements uh, for the SEP. So 10 MEV at 10 PFU, et cetera. Um, and then if I keep stepping forward a little bit, uh, you'll, you'll see it update again. And actually you can put a movie play button here as well. 
Um, so that's what we're looking to do. So if you hit a play button, you can actually see more or less seamlessly how the forecast evolves. Um, and, and eventually one of the few limitations that I've actually found is that you can't have double double axes with one being log and one being linear with bokeh as of yet. So, but they're working on that. So eventually we want to make, make a double Y here. So your probability goes from zero to hundred percent. And you can see in general how that compares to the event that you see. So if I just walk forward a, you know, a couple of days and keep in mind this general pattern here and keep in mind that it's probability, not measurement. Uh, let's see if the, what this event actually looked and then I'll, I'll wrap up by showing one more additional demo. So there's the SEP event. It was fairly well connected. Um, so if I were to guess that this was on the Western limb um, and I actually don't recall. So where is this flare? Is it this one? No, it's this guy. So yeah, it's on the 76 uh, uh, longitude. So it's definitely on the Western part of the sun there. Uh, and you can see that that's the association for it. All right, lastly, a month later or so, just to show you the extensibility of these types of dashboards, you can build in. I really haven't found any limitations other than the plot uh, Y axes that I just mentioned. So fast forwarding uh, one month into the future here, um, let's, let's take a look at uh, uh, a CME here and a visualization we did with that. So update plot again. Again, give it a few seconds. It's pretty reactive considering that it's going through a big database here. Um, so here you can see that there were a couple of M-class flares that went off. If I were to guess their CMEs interacted with each other, gave us this set measured. Um, and then additionally, you can see the shock of the CME uh, and then the CME sheath itself. And so just to show you the extensibility of, hey, I want this dashboard to look like this because I'm an operator, I'm a researcher. Um, you know, you can do anything with it. So let's click on this. Uh, CME, keep in mind that it does have a little bit of a shock component to it, uh, and then the CME sheath, and then we have a nice 3D visualization of that CME as it passes by the L1 um, with some metadata printed out in this box here. And, and again, more to demonstrate the extensibility of these types of any, but, but certainly I, I think predicting the uh, the helicity, whether it goes counterclockwise, clockwise, depending on your frame of reference, is just as important as predicting BZ uh, because it speaks to how you would predict BZ in the first place. Um, and, and so we hope to get a little mini project of, of doing just this um, in terms of predicting it um, uh, along with a couple of smaller mini projects. So that concludes sort of the mini demonstrations that I had with this dashboard. Um, you know, just because of time, I, I could show you other things like the room, tell me your favorite date and we jump to it and take a look at it and have all sorts of fun, uh, seeing, seeing what you see. Um, but that concludes this, this sort of, uh, uh, capability. I'll leave this up, um, in case there are questions in the end, but just to, to sort of wrap up and go through really quickly, the remaining slides. So you're going to have to forgive me. This is going to be really fast. All right. So here's a, a dashboard architecture for what I just showed you. This is how it's built, okay? So again, I'm gonna go through it really quickly. Back to the SCP forecasting. This basically shows you all of the SCP events in our database distributed by, organized by the AFRL, Air Force Research Lab set requirements. So you have your, your blue ones here are your typical 10 MeV at 10 PFU. So your S1 events, if you're familiar with that uh, on the NOAA SWIPTI scale, all the way out to 100 MeV at 100 PFU. AFRL wants these forecasted at a resolution of six hours. So the way we did it was, all right, let's do it by 24 hours, 12, then by six. And also we're like, hey, really, this is a time series machine learning problem. We haven't done that yet. We're hoping that future work will let us do that, um, but we really haven't. There are additional sort of cool interactive uh, 3D. Uh, there's an analysis dashboard that I basically really like to pull up next to that main time series dashboard I showed you. Um, and this, this, these are all the flares that are not associated to SEPs and the green ones are flares that are associated to SEPs. You have your fluence, longitude and ratio as your parameters. Uh, you can change them on your X and your Y and your Z axis. 
to show flux instead of fluence, uh, to show latitude instead of longitude. And you have that option for, for all of the, the four uh, AFRL requirements. A scatter plot matrix is a way to go as well to see multidimensional relationships as well as uh, parallel coordinates. So we're currently putting that dashboard together. Uh, and so maybe if I have a mini update for this group here come September, October, I'll show you that dashboard separately. Um, so the ma machine learn model here that we use was MLP multi-layer perceptron model. Um, here's sort of the results that we get. These are pretty competitive in terms of Hideki skill score, the HSS. So after optimizing the results, again, for these 24 hour bins. So we just assume going out to 96 hours, we do a pretty good job of that. Here's the 12 hour, 12 hour resolutions. We retain that 0.5 ish, uh, 0.6 ish Hideki skill score. So we feel comfortable moving now perhaps um, to the six hour ones, which is really what's required. If you wanna know how we compare up against Noah Swipsy, um, they have their model protons here from Chris Balsh, 2008, probability of detection, 57%, false alarm rate of 50%. The multi-layer perceptron model from sprints is 60% and 41%. Uh, uh, and so it, it's a pretty good improvement or a decent improvement there. Uh, and then Swipsy human in the loop is pretty high probability of detection, also 24%. Why is it so good? Well, sometimes you get events uh, and you're watching the threshold go up. So you're seeing, hey, we're, they, they define the event by 10 PFU. So that's their threshold. So a Swipsy forecaster can watch 4 PFU, 5 PFU, 6 PFU, 8 PFU. Oh my gosh, we're probably going to get an event. So I'm going to give a forecast. So it's not cheating, but you need to realize sort of the nuances in terms of what goes into forecasting. And then for the 100 MEV at, 100, at 1 PFU, um, we, we, uh, really, we, we clearly beat out human in the loop, uh, um, as have to keep in mind, this is apples to oranges because they're using a different database than we are, um, and all of that good stuff. Uh, we threw the book at it uh, we did all the scikit learning libraries. Um, and this is really a robust way of, of seeing which model is best. So we did tenfold cross validation. And if you're wondering why the skill scores are so low, that is why. Um, so really, yeah, gosh, just running out of time. This is typically a, a hour and a half demonstration, but here you can see back to the architecture. Um, here you can see NASA CMC, BSO, Heliophysics Data Portal, HEC and Sharps. And then please imagine PySat there or whatever uh, APIs that are within these other Python libraries can work and interact with this system as well. So sprints is a forest. So please see the forest for the trees. So I just showed you how sprints can be used uh, for forecasting SEPs using machine learning, but it can be used for a variety of things. Research coordination across teams and institutions, physics-based modeling analysis, especially with the use of Komodo. In terms of uh, data analysis and download capabilities, uh, heliophysics uh, data access, and then everything else I think was previously mentioned. Um, here are some of the mini projects we did. Um, and then the Sprints community. Um, really, really, I, I view communities such as the Python heliophysics community feeding the fuel into the Sprints uh, uh, ecosystem, or if you call it the Pan Helio, and it evolves into something like that. So it really becomes that, that fuel for that R to O, O to R to um, So with that, and apologies, um, wanted to leave a little bit extra time. I am available to stay on longer here if the discussion goes over the hour, but I, I will stop here. So thanks very much. And thank you very much. Just trying to see if there's anything else worth showing, uh, but yeah. It's a whirlwind, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why, why I've seen it a couple of times helps. So the framework for this and the setup, is that that's owned by NextGen or that's open source or what's the status of like the whole setup? Yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about the business model. 
that we have. So it's a, it's a small business innovative research. So the idea is to commercialize the technology you build. Um, I'm, we, we recognize uh, the, the need for open source capabilities and, and generally the way NextGen does business is we give all government purpose rights for everything we develop. So if not long and say, hey, NextGen, we want you to take sprints and do task orders one through five to support X, Y, and Z capabilities, we'll say, great, we're going to do that for you. We're a services company. We're going to give you all government purpose rights to do that. We're going to deploy it at CCMC um, and all of that stuff. We just want to be taken along for the development ride uh, until you find somebody better slash cheaper to do it, right? So that's what we do. Uh, but right now, this is a TR level six, five, probably a five. Um, and, and so to get to that point where it can be used by the wider community, we hope somebody like NOAA, NASA, Air Force, and gosh, maybe NOAA and NASA can collectively work together since they're so 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 focused on the R to O, O to R stuff that they would want um, to sort of team up together and, and fund this type of capability. And we say, great, we're gonna we're gonna do those task orders for you guys uh, and support your 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 different needs, and then we'll make sure that you guys own it. Uh, so we'll we'll make sure the government and if the government's it, especially if you're NASA. Then, then you can pretty much be guaranteed that this is going to be open to the community for, for use. But again, it's getting that initial resource beyond this sort of TR level five development where we're at right now. But yeah, we're not looking to license the software straight up. We're, we're looking to develop it more and mature it more. I'll just end on the, this guy. Yeah, so I really want to work with with folks like um, with with Russell um, and and Rebecca uh, and everybody else here, and, and to see how we can align all these different wonderful efforts in in Python library development, and and see if we can get some alignment. Um, I think it does require sort of going after a bigger fish type of deal when you talk about trying to connect everybody together uh, in, in such a, a, a grand picture, like similar to Pangeo. But uh, again, I think it's worth to align efforts and, and get everybody on the same page uh, and, and speaking the same language and, and seeing what you're doing. Um, yeah. Hey, um, it is 10.01, so I won't be too offended if people drop off, but Alec, I do have one last question for you. Yeah, again, um, I'm I'm happy to stay on here for I I'm I'm pretty free today, so I'm I'm happy to stay on. Yep. Um. So, looking at the bottom left corner here again at the adapters and and data inputs and yeah. everything, um. Yeah. So you can get data from a variety of sources. Do you have some kind of internal like proprietary data model that you came together to like you know represent an abstract version of the data, or do you, did you stick to one kind of format that you converted to? No, we haven't, but I can guarantee you if it's imagery data, it's either going to be net CDF or czar. Gotcha. I guarantee it uh, because that's what works well with Dask and X-Array. Any, anything else besides net CDF and the other one? Uh, no, not particularly. Um, that That's something that needs to be understood a little bit more. more on Instance, okay. it's like okay. Uh, so, just an example of how this could work to support heliophysics IT infrastructure, right? So, let's say you want to prove that that you can do use use bokeh, use Dask and X Ray to analyze heliophysics. <coughs> pardon me, imagery e more easily. So, how are you going to demonstrate that? Well. Maybe pick the biggest X flares from from the last solar cycle and say, okay, I'm going to convert all those into net CDF or czar format because you know a lot of the community tends to use those data sets during solar eruptive times. So you're not du you're when you duplicate data, you're you're duplicating the volume and the cost that you have to do it. So maybe if you're targeted in terms of what you choose to duplicate namely around solar eruptions, namely around large solar eruptions, 
maybe you prove uh, you demonstrate that. So when you convert fits to net CDF to czar, you are at least focused in that. And so you're not converting the whole story of files into net CDF and czar, you are converting only or at least in majority what people would focus on potentially for their research. And again, there are going to be cases around that where, where you can't, and maybe, maybe they need to, but um, you know, that's, that's the general thinking there on how this could be extended to, to make better use of, of heliophysics, it uh, data repositories as well. Uh, so instead of folks, you know, downloading fits and whatnot, and then analyzing it on their local computer, maybe of those fields at those IT repositories that are already translated. So for instance, all the X class flares from the previous solar cycle, which by the way, weren't many, there were only like 25 of them. So if you converted all of those fits file observations of those X class flares, and maybe the 24 hours leading up to it, um, you, you would not, that would not be a terrible heavy lift. You know, that would be probably on the order of 20 to 30 uh, terabytes. Again, a lot, not a lot. Um, and then users can actually go to that and, and that solar physics imagery data there and then <clears throat> be focused on what they download as well. So just an additional thought on that. So I have a question and um, Alec, if you'd rather think about this offline and just get back to us later, that's fine. But sure. um, so this is based off of the idea from the, uh, how do I say this? From an ecosystem paper that Alec and I and others have been working on. Um, most of the people on this call have a copy of it. But typically for a good, um, a good technology development, the idea would be to develop it so much to put yourself out of business um, or to develop it so much that other people, you develop it to the point where other people can um, do that development on their own. And then the organization becomes more of a support for the other people's work rather than doing it for them. So what would it take for this ecosystem to get to the point where people could develop their own dashboard on their own, whereas where NextGen would turn into a support system rather than um, performing the task for them? Or is that not where NextGen wants to go? No, I think that's exactly where we want to go, like 100%. We, we want to sort of demonstrate, like, this is what you can make with the dash situ example dashboard for ionospheric example dashboard for magnetospheric and so on and say oh great here's the code for it go forth and and develop your own dashboards um and so certainly we want to take it in that direction where developing these dashboards are more in the hands of the users um rather than users coming to next and say we want to you to make this dashboard it's like great we that that's good we can if you really want us to um but but we we're more interested in in uh, again more of the dod type of commercialization of this effort um and and sort of the broader the broader enterprise it support of this and less of the dashboarding but certainly want to demonstrate up front what can be dashboarded and i do need to think about it a little bit more in terms of how that transition would happen um you know if, if we have like i said those five or six different dashboards that hit the different systems of heliophysics um maybe that would be enough uh, to sort of release to the public but maybe even that ccmc would say okay now you just need to be a registered user on sprints and so with that here's sort of your go ahead and read this how to get started on sprints chapter six is build your own dashboard um a, a type of deal so at least that's what i'm generally thinking again details uh fuzzy um but but that's how i would like to take it forward and, and next gen would just be supporting on you know the user side and and sort of the back end what needs to be database for instance we'd like to control uh what the database um and, and maybe uh build extensibility for people 
um, to to use to use the database in in a wi wider variety of, of of ways. If that helps, Rebecca. Oh, that's great. Um, one question, maybe a devil's advocate question. <laughs> yeah, bring <laughs> but, it. But um, does NextGen have any foresight on how this can be done for other research fields, not just heliophysics? Yes. It's funny you ask that. Um, so let's see here. Pardon me. So we did it for soil moisture. And I actually presented this to you guys still see my am I still sharing? I am, right? Yes. Okay. So so we we did this for soil moisture as well. We created dashboards for soil moisture. The idea was to do machine learning for soil moisture. Um, so basically here there are, we created different dashboards for soil moisture. I showed this to the SMAP level four team. SMAP is a NASA mission. It stands for soil moisture, active, passive, um, and it sure globally around the earth. Um, and, and basically we created this dashboard and a lot of this was actually how we, we could sp spin up sprints so quickly because we had this experience. But here you can see I'm using GeoViews, HoloViews and all these wonderful libraries to stream through terabytes of geospatial data. And then here I'm able to create a new dashboard and actually abstract all that Python code away. And so here's just an earth science example of how sprints or we call this project smart uh, can be used to a variety uh, to a wider audience um, so the ability is there um, and, and so and just to give you an idea this gives you a more in-depth analysis on imagery type of stuff rather than in situ dashboard i was showing you guys but i click on this region in texas because this is a region we want to prove out our machine learn model and we use data shader and all these wonderful libraries and we compare uh, different different layers against each other absolute depth to bedrock to bulk density do some scatter plots because we want to understand relationships so rebecca without getting into the details there you know this is totally, totally extensible if if you have this broad ecosystem for let's just say nasa as a whole and you want to have registered users and they come in and they're like, hey, I'm Earth Sciences. And again, similar to what Pangeo can do today, um, but they can come in and say, OK, well, I have this particular data set. Uh, how do I how do I translate it into net net CDF or czar? And how do I build my own dashboard, my analysis dashboard? How do I build it? So if I'm the SMAP level four team, uh, users who want to download SMAP, app level for to go and down go through um you know those those more difficult to to uh, uh you know navigate sites in terms of downloading data you can be more precise like hey i don't need the whole smap level data for the globe i just need this texas aoi so i'm going to select this texas aoi and click download and now i'm going to get that download button so this is just an example of how of how we use the jupiter hub and the AWS cloud system in a very similar fashion to Sprint, but again, more, more earth science focused. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, this was a fun, fun project. And you can see bad data when you can visualize all the data sources, you can see like these circles outside of CONUS. Um, you know, and this is from IBM, the weather company. I was like, hey guys, you guys see this bad data you guys are selling? Um, didn't hear much of a response from that. But yeah, time series data, click a point near Houston. You see time series data pop up really quickly. So this is the soil moisture data. And then you can see her uh, late, late, uh, I think it was September, 2017. This is a pre-recorded demo. So that's why I'm able to fly through it. But all of these types of dashboards you can make. Um, and again, it, it lets you understand your data set that much uh, more quickly, especially when you're concerned with terabytes. Scatter plot matrices. This was satellite. So this is an example of how we used it with satellites. So I just showed you uh, numerical weather modeling and this one in particular satellite. So anyways. But yeah, it's a lot of fun as a data scientist when you're able to stream through terabytes of data, uh, you get a better handle 
on on understanding data relationships and things like that and and then translating that and helping the machine learning expert who is a machine learning expert no no particular understanding in your area um uh, but if you're able to walk him or her through these types of dashboards and say hey this this is the relationship and you know it just helps them uh, understand it uh, uh, more effectively as well which is critical for that for that ai ml uh, application oh yeah if you guys are still chilling with me um so you guys may have heard of cesium um uh, and, and there's actually a python uh, cesium capability so this is actually using the the ecp measurements uh on board uh all the gps satellites um and so I can imagine pulling this up, this dashboard, the, with the analysis dashboard, with whatever dashboards you want, right? And so this is basically showing the, the electron measurements. Uh, if I can click on this satellite, let me just pause one so we can see some metadata pop up. So the metadata is in the top right. Let me just see if I can zoom in there, right? So what's being visualized is the two MEV electron flux there from uh, I think N63 GPS asset there. Um, and, and this is from 2014. So if I was quickly to go to the dashboard, I would go to G15. You would see that the solar wind is picking up and a little bit, uh, this is a two week period. And so I'll just go really fast through it. Um, but you can see uh, sort of the radiation environments. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't make the plugin of cesium work more effectively with Python and deploy this as a dashboard as well. Um, and, and thinking about SatPy and Komodo um, uh, working with this, maybe this is more of an operational one um, uh, than, than an analysis one, but, but certainly uh, analysis nonetheless. And you can go to different vantage points and things like that. And this is open source as well. And that's why you can do all sorts of plugins with Python and whatnot um using this and, and sorry it's probably going too fast if you're getting dizzy um but here you can see we're january 9th and we're well into a a, a cme that hit earth and and this is sort of the the influx of electrons that have come to the the inner part of the magnetosphere so just a just another demonstration another dashboard that you could potentially insert another tool in your tool belt right I can pull that up if you guys want to see the it's a January 2014 it's January we'll do 05 update plot just to show you an example of how I would pull it up side by side okay. More. So there you can see you actually had some SEP events associated with it, with these flares here. Um, and so we're at January 10th on the, on the satellite imagery view here. And then uh, that's right around here. So this is the time period you're seeing on the right. So again, just trying to give you the best situational awareness possible um, by, by looking at data in different ways. Uh, and there's no reason why you couldn't have the time series of the satellites in a dashboard like this, right? So we just displayed it from a geospatial perspective instead of in situ. Uh, but again, using the, the open source type of stuff is is critical to, to, I think, grow it. And I think this community pretty much agrees with that. Yeah, and then what's next? Uh, just to to wrap up, maybe the final comment. If I if I give a follow up demonstration to you all, uh, September, October, November timeframe, I'll have results based on and radio bursts on top of the uh, the solar flare parameters that were used to predict the SEPs. Um, and I hear a lot of people say like, "Hey, CMEs are more important than solar flares." and and radio bursts, and I, I say yes, they are. All reasons point to yes, but you have to be aware that when you do just CMEs or radio bursts, you are cutting out a significant number of events um, prior to that 1998 time period, 
Um, and so if you take a data-driven approach, you want your statistics to be possible. Um, that said, uh, I'm really looking forward to those results. Um, and also, you know, CME kinematics, they sometimes require human in the loop calculations. Uh, they're not available exactly in real time. There's a delay. Um, and so there's a lot of good reasons to start with solar flares as your foundation for predicting SEPs and building up from there. Um, and again, the, the, it's extensible to pretty much any, 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 uh, anything you want to data fuse together with it. So well, cool guys, thanks. Thanks for the extra time and, and, and sticking, sticking on with me uh, a little bit longer here. Please reach out to me if you're interested in, in getting IP whitelisted, happy to do so for this community. Um, you know, keeping in mind, play nice, um, uh, on it, you know, don't upload a, a ton of stuff, but just reach out to me, um, uh, uh anytime and, and we'll get you on here. Uh, it, it should be open for the next six to eight months, if not longer, uh, based on current funding. Um, and, and if you have any projects that could take advantage, I mean, that's certainly what it's used for. And again, this is kind of worth worthless from the standpoint of the bigger picture of what sprints could be used for um, uh, unless we get people to, to to advocate for something like this i mean we certainly can do an scp forecasting model that's really good for the dod but for me the the sort of bigger picture is is getting it so it's widely used and so we streamline our our science um, in heliophysics so. right on any closing remarks or questions, guys? Again, thank you. All right, Julie. <laughs> Thanks, Alec. That was awesome. You bet. Um, as soon as I can get in touch with Alex, I'll get the recording for this and put it up with the meeting minutes. Um, apart from that, just our next telecom will be, I believe it's in two weeks, on July 26th. And Bob Weagle will present a MagnetoVis project update. So. Look forward to that. See y'all. See you guys. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thanks.